What's up everybody? So several months ago my fiance and I are having a hangout and we invite a few of her friends over. Among these friends is a friend of ours, Carl. So sometime before that, Carl had let us know that he had a Super Nintendo uh, with a bunch of games. It was essentially his Super Nintendo childhood collection. So he had offered it to us. And being the gaming enthusiast that I am, there was really no way that I would have turned that down. A long time after that, our friends show up. And Carl has this box, this massive box of, uh, it was like an empty box of Huggies or something like that. And the whole thing was filled with Super Nintendo games and a Nintendo, a, a Super Nintendo as well. To my shock, the Super Nintendo was complete in box. And, and just like that, with no strings attached, the guy gifts us his childhood Super Nintendo collection. I think you guys know where I'm coming from when I say that that's a huge deal. So as a way to thank him, I wanted to showcase this collection. And thank him by telling you all a short series of stories relating to each game. I hope you guys enjoy this video. I myself don't have too many memories with the Donkey Kong Country Trilogy, uh, although I do have one. Back in Mexico, I have a cousin uh, named Keno, who had a... I couldn't tell you which Donkey Kong Country it was, but in this Donkey Kong Country, there was a... There was like a, like a special island that you can access, and you needed so many coins. If I remember correctly, it was coins, and those coins gave you access to extra levels and they were guarded by this giant uh, crocodile with a club. That was a pretty distinct memory for me because uh, of the location. My cousin's Super Nintendo was in his parents' bedroom, probably to keep him from playing it too much, maybe they just wanted to keep an eye on him, I don't know. But I remember what a big deal it was to him to show me these secret levels. He was showing me these secret levels for a game I was hardly even familiar with. But just to share that excitement with him, you know, just to, just to feel the, the positive energy of, oh, you've got to see this, man. You gotta collect so many coins and you unlock these levels and uh, check it out. I haven't unlocked them all, but I've got a few so far. Interestingly enough, that was one of the earliest memories of the Super Nintendo that I had. The fact that the gift included not just the cartridges, but the strategy guides as well, to me is a sign that I probably should just hop on these games and start streaming them. It would be my first time I had ever completed these games, it'd be my first time I'd ever played these games. So having the guides along with the manuals, uh, it gives me a, a big incentive to actually play the games, since I have all the tools necessary to, to, com to complete them. If I had to guess, I'd say it was probably Donkey Kong Country 2 that had the hidden the hidden world with the additional levels. Donkey Kong Country 3 I can't really say I have any memories of other than... Anyway, uh, Donkey Kong Country 3 I can't say I really have any memories of. Other than the level where you have to play as the elephant and the, the rats just keep pushing you away, I found that level so freaking annoying as a kid. And even going back now to record this footage, I found that level annoying today. As a whole, I think the original Donkey Kong Country trilogy is awesome and I can't wait to play them.
Being the fan that I am of Super Mario Bros. 3, uh, the idea of a bigger, better game being out there in the form of Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo was huge. I remember back in the day there was a store, it was, uh, I want to say it was like a record store that also sold video games. Uh, that was the first time I had ever seen a Super Nintendo bundled with Super Mario World. And I remember, you know, turning the box around and just really looking at the pictures on the back and uh, just uh, feeling this level of ex this, this certain excitement within me to, uh, to see the successor to Super Mario Bros. 3. Once again, uh, I was introduced to uh, the gameplay by my cousin Ivan. And all I really remember about that memory is how, how he was exploring the... I, I keep wanting to call him the Lost Woods. No, this is not The Legend of Zelda. Maybe it is called The Lost Woods, I'm not sure. Uh, but there was a forest-themed uh, world that had all these different pathways and, you know, depending on how you cleared the levels, you'd wind up left or you'd wind up to the right. Uh, but, you know, there was only really one path. Ultimately, there was a path that would lead you out of that world and, you know, to the castle and then to the following world. And I remember Ivan clearing a, a specific level where Mario gets blown up like a small balloon and he'd float across underneath a, a series of uh, branches or trees. And, uh, and there it was. There was a hidden key down there that he had to acquire that way. And uh, I remember this, uh, the sense of satisfaction when he found the key on his own without having to research it uh, or without having, having to ask his friends because the internet wasn't really a thing back then. It wasn't really, you know, at least not mainstream. The internet was not something that everybody could just access. So, you know, the only way you'd clear a level is uh, through word of mouth or, or just, you know, maybe someone, in, maybe one of your friends had Nintendo Power magazines or something like that. But I remember uh, his excitement and joy in finding uh, the key on his own, and that was really cool to just share that moment with him. And at the time, I was such a small kid, you know, and uh, as you know, you know, teenagers aren't always nice to kids, you know, and I had my share of the good and the bad in that regard. You know, I've, I've had family members that wouldn't even so much as let me watch them play a video game. Uh, whereas this, this family member here, he'd always include me as often as he could. Uh, he had introduced me to so many games. He introduced me to Super Mario World, uh, Duke Nukem, uh, Star Fox 64. Really, it was just... It was just a pleasant gaming experience for me. Uh, it was a pleasant gaming memory that I that I shared with him. Uh, just watching him find his way out of this forest and making it to uh, to the next castle. I can't really say that I played a whole lot of Yoshi's Island. You know, the thing you would hear most often is just people complaining about Mario's crying. A lot of gamers found that unbearable. For that reason, I don't really feel I gave the game a chance. Not until I got into emulation as a teenager. Eventually, I downloaded the ROM and, you know, I gave it a shot and I was pleasantly surprised. It kind of just goes to show you that you shouldn't follow what other people tell you about games. You know, you definitely ought to try them yourself. Visually, it's a great looking game. The colors are really nice. Uh, I think that calling it the successor to Super Mario World was not a good way to go. The games are so different, you know? But overall, I'd say it's a pretty fun game. Super Mario RPG Legend of the Seven Stars. So when I was in high school, I had a friend, his name was Enrique. Now Enrique had a lot of Super Nintendo stuff. I remember Enrique having a Super Scope and, uh, and this game here. Uh, these were the two things that stood out to me the most in his collection. I remember wanting Super Mario RPG back in high school. And one of the major allures of the game was the fact that it was not affordable. I couldn't get it. Uh, my part-time job was terrible. <laughs> uh, there was no way I was going to be able to afford it, not without breaking the bank at least. So you can imagine my reaction when I found out that was in Carl's collection. That day at, at Enrique's place, we, we played a lot of Xbox. I think we played a lot of Fusion Frenzy, and I remember just in the back of my mind wanting to just borrow 
uh, Super Mario RPG and just pop it in and just play it for a few minutes because I had never played it before. So because of this gift, you've basically given me a chance to try out this game that I've been wanting to play since I was a teenager. Super Mario Kart. My first experience with Mario Kart was with Mario Kart 64. Uh, having cleared the whole game and uh, acquired all the cups and everything in the game, I thought I was really good at it. And then I tried Super Mario Kart for the first time with my buddy Gary. I was terrible at it. <laughs> While my buddy Garrett was averaging first or second place, I was averaging fifth or sixth. I was just really bad at it. I had assumed that my skill in, in Mario Kart 64 was going to translate to Super Mario Kart, but it didn't. Not even... no. <laughs> So Tetris and Dr. Mario were two games that I owned on the NES, uh, never on the Super Nintendo. And seeing them in a bundle uh, on a single cartridge I thought was really, really cool. The games are what you'd expect them to be. You know, Tetris is the same as it always has been on like, like on the Game Boy. And Dr. Mario, that hasn't changed either. Uh, but graphically, they do look a lot nicer, which adds to the overall enjoyment of the two games. Killer Instinct. Oh my god, do I love Killer Instinct. So my earliest memory of Killer Instinct was visiting my cousin Luis's house. The two of us had worked together to play through the game uh, using Spinal. We remember how difficult it was to run through the game, so we had set it on the easiest difficulty. So to our dismay, we came to discover that you don't get to fight idle unless you set the difficulty higher. So we raised the difficulty and we played through the game again. After countless losses against Idol, we managed to beat him. And we were uh, awarded with this, this uh, not even an ending, it was, uh, it was just a wall of text, uh, basically insulting the player for playing it on such a low difficulty. So once again, we cranked up the difficulty and we beat the game again. And we were greeted with this ending, uh, that, that Spinal had joined Hollywood or something like that, like he was in a movie. So thinking back now, it, it had to have been a reference to like Jason and the Argonauts. We kind of just stared at the ending in disappointment. We were like, man, that, that sucked. <laughs> that was a terrible ending. Now Street Fighter 2, I remember visiting uh, my parents' friends and uh, their son had a copy of Street Fighter 2 for the Super Nintendo. I myself was really bad at it, I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, since he owned the game, he was, you know, he was decent at it. And I remember kind of just sitting back and watching him play through the whole game. The excitement I felt when he had beaten the roster, and then more portraits popped up on the map. And I just lit up, I said, whoa, these are like hidden bosses, this is really cool. Upon defeating those three, uh, Bison popped up as the final boss. The epic music with the bell. Round one, fight. It really just hits you, you know? It's like, oh shit, this dude is the real deal. <laughs> So as I had mentioned before, uh, my experience with Star Fox came from Star Fox 64, and I just absolutely loved that game. The dialogue, the the fact that the game takes itself seriously despite the fact that the, the characters are just talking animals. Uh, my first time playing Star Fox for the Super Nintendo was actually through a request by, uh, uh, who you know, his name was I Don't Give a Thumb at the time, he goes by Thumb Brothers now. 
so live I had cleared one route. I think it was just the easiest route. It was route one. Uh, the game has two other routes that I have actually yet to play through. So that's something that I hope to come back to in the future. I personally feel like Star Fox for the Super Nintendo is harder than the one for the Nintendo 64. Uh, but I hear a lot of differing opinions on that. It's probably because I grew up with Star Fox 64 and uh, it has the lock-on mechanic. Whereas the Super Nintendo title I didn't really play at all as a teenager, as a child, uh, even as a young adult. But my first playthrough on the Super Nintendo was an absolute blast, and I can't wait to come back to it. I can't wait to play some Star Fox 2 as well. That's something I haven't even tried yet. <laughs> Super Smash TV. I'd buy that for a dollar. Smash TV is a franchise I myself haven't played a whole lot. Uh, the first time I had ever played the original Smash TV was in arcades. And I remember making it to a boss in that game. And the boss just wouldn't die. I kept firing at him and firing at him and firing at him. And uh, I, he kept killing me, I kept running out of quarters, I kept pumping in quarters into the machine. The boss just kept exploding and breaking apart and just, you know, just crumbling to pieces. But he wouldn't die. I later came to find out that Smash TV actually had a spiritual successor called Total Carnage. And Total Carnage is largely the same in that regard. The bosses just refuse to die. <laughs> I'm pretty excited about having Super Smash TV in my collection now, uh, mostly because I have the opportunity to really sit there and practice playing the game. I'd really love to play this cooperatively sometime with a friend. I'm pretty sure the next time somebody visits, I'm gonna have them play the game alongside with me, just so we can see how we fare. The Legend of Zelda a Link to the Past was a really big game for a lot of family members that I had growing up. Because I didn't really grow up with the Super Nintendo, my go-to Zelda games were Zelda's 1 and 2. Because I didn't grow up with A Link to the Past, I myself didn't have that big of a connection like my cousins did. Although I do remember a few gaming memories from it. I had a cousin who was much older than me, Alex, who was obsessed with that game. We had gone on this family trip, and I remember one of my friends let me borrow a Link to the Past on the Game Boy Advance. So I was just playing around with the game for a little bit, not really, you know, taking it seriously. And my cousin Alex sees the Game Boy Advance, and the moment he realized that I was playing A Link to the Past on a handheld, it just blew his mind. His eyes were wide open, he was like, holy shit, you know? So he basically ends up taking the Game Boy Advance away from me, and he spends the rest of the day just playing that. We had this family trip, we were checking out all these landmarks and everything, and he was just glued to that little screen. On principle alone, I, I played through the entire game at least once, and I acquired every single heart piece, I made it to the boss and I beat the game, I watched the ending, and for me that was kind of like, a, like the end of a chapter for me. Like I said, okay, I'm done with this game, I'm really happy, I don't really see myself picking it up again anytime soon. And now that I have it in my collection, I'm thinking it's about time I play it again. Super Alfred Chicken. <laughs> I, I had never heard of this game before. I know there's one for the NES called Alfred Chicken. I, I'm not too familiar with the series. I guess it's a series. I mean, if there's more than one, then it's a series, right? Just out of curiosity, I gave it a spin. I checked it out. You know, I recorded a little gameplay. And it's a fairly challenging game. The cartoonish aesthetics are pretty cool. It was a fun little time waster. My favorite thing about the game has to be the game over screen. It shows like a little cooked chicken. It, it just looks so funny. If anybody has any memories with Super Alfred Chicken or Alfred Chicken as a whole, please let me know in the comments because I really feel bad that I don't have a whole lot to say about that game. Uh, but really, I just didn't grow up with it. Uh, and this was literally the first time I had ever played it was just through this cartridge that, uh, that was gifted to me. So Super Metroid, holy crap. Prior to Super Metroid, my only experience was with the original Metroid. 
I had made it to Mother Brain, and all the crap that just comes from every direction hit me and I died. Having to farm for health over and over again put a really bad taste in my mouth. For that reason, I just hadn't touched Metroid games ever since. The amount of effort involved in refilling those uh, energy tanks was just so tedious, it just really killed the fun out of it. It wasn't until uh, I watched Mike Acosta from the YouTube channel Casadores del Ocio that I really gained an appreciation for Super Metroid. Watching that guy just demolish that game is, is, is just so satisfying. Now, I myself haven't really gained the courage to stream that game. Maybe off stream, you know, I'll play through the game and just become familiar with it. Because uh, people have nothing but good things to say about that game. It's such a visually impressive game, and even today it still holds up. So this cartridge was a bit of a mystery to me, largely because it just had a label uh, with the with the words Dungeons and Dragons written on there. So I was really curious to see like who the publisher was, who developed the game. I gave the game a try, I played it for a few minutes, and this is a game you desperately need a manual for. I had no idea what I was doing, I couldn't get anywhere in the game. So in short, I'm gonna have to keep an eye out for a manual on eBay, and once I find a manual at a reasonable price, I'm gonna pop that cartridge in and I'm gonna give it a go. It's a good looking game. It, it plays well enough, you know, for a point and click adventure. It's just, uh, I just didn't know what I was doing. I'm definitely interested though. I think I'm gonna check that game out when I get a chance. So I don't know anything about sports. But NBA Jam is a lot of fun. Even though I myself am not really big on sports, I do really like the arcadey sports titles like NFL Blitz. So uh, getting this one in my collection was pretty cool. It's pretty fun. Kind of reminds me of the days of playing other sports games that I myself am not too familiar with, like, like Tecmo Bowl, for example. So for the sake of this video, I played through one game. Uh, I couldn't quite win, <laughs> but, uh, but I gave it my best shot. The attempt was a lot of fun. Maybe Carl can show me a thing or two. So what I noticed mostly about Carl's uh, Nintendo Power Collection was that they stemmed from like the late Super Nintendo era to the early Nintendo 64 days, and that was really cool. While a lot of people don't really find value in these magazines, uh, I kind of see them as like a trip to the past, you know, just seeing what was relevant at the time, what were people talking about at the time. Mostly what I remember from seeing these Nintendo Powers in stores was my excitement for the games that were on the covers, you know? I still remember seeing Turok on the magazine and just wanting to rent it from Blockbuster. Or the hype behind GoldenEye 64. Like, what a huge game that was for everybody. People just love that game. People still go crazy for that game. Since then, I've individually packaged them. I'm taking as best a care as I can of them because I just I want them to last a very long time. And that about sums up everything that Carl sent me, so uh, thank you so much, Carl, for, for the gift you, you gave us. This gift actually got us back into using original hardware again, so having, having a Super Nintendo again and just playing the cartridges as they were intended has been a ton of fun. 
And of course, I want to thank everybody that stuck around and watched this entire video. I hope to see you in future videos, in future streams, and thank you everybody for the support, really. Thanks again, everybody.